you guys are going to get uh, some more fun time looking at God's Word, uh, looking about how God keeps his people. Jade to do the Bible reading. Thanks, Jade. Okay, so in the Pew Bibles, it's on page 1004. Brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. I can testify about them that they have zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. Since they are ignorant of the righteousness of God and attempted to establish their own righteousness, they have not submitted to God's righteousness. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes, since Moses writes about the righteousness that is from the law. The one who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart who will go up to heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will go down into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved." How then can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes with the message about Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? Yes, they did. Their voice has gone out to the whole earth and their words to the ends of the world. But I ask, did Israel not understand? First Moses said, I will make you jealous of those who are not a nation. I will make you angry by a nation that lacks understanding. And Isaiah says boldly, I was found by those who were not looking for me. I revealed myself to those who were not asking for me. But to Israel, he says, all day long, I have held out my hands to a disobedient and defiant people. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Got a collection of Bibles for me here. Let's just ask the Lord to bless our time together. Father, we do pray that you would speak to us from your word. We pray that we would... Um, in appropriate ways, see that this applies directly to us, and we pray that uh, this would inform the way we relate to you and to one another and to these great truths. So we ask for your your grace and mercy in this time, in Jesus' name. Amen. So I was asked um, oh, several months ago to do a, a public lecture on um, something, I don't even want to name the topic, it was casual sex, and I agreed to do it, and then I was um, exposed to the advertising that was all around the place. And it said it's a series based on Romans 12, 1 and 2 about not being conformed to this world. And so I thought, well, okay, that's got to inform what I do. And if that's going to inform what I do, the first word of Romans 12, 1 is therefore. So I need to read the previous chapters and find out what's the therefore, therefore. And that's why we ended up um, looking at chapters 9 to 11 uh, today. Uh, and tomorrow, because uh, as I was thinking through those things and trying to prepare a talk, um, looking toward Romans 12, uh, Bernard rang me up and said, do you want to come and uh, talk to us? And I was um, doing my normal thing, which was to read through those chapters. And so I said, yeah, I'll do that, and I'll look at these chapters. Uh, when I prepare something, what I like to do is read something seven times, because I start to make observations 
uh, as I go through. By the third or fourth time, I might have some questions that are forming. By the fifth, sixth, seventh time, I might start to find answers to those questions. So um, I tried to read Romans 9 to 11 every day for seven days. And I would encourage you to do the same. And I keep encouraging people to do this, saying you're going to find great things. I don't think anybody's ever done it. But um, it, you know, if you do, uh, it would be a, a rewarding experience. Uh, Romans 10 talks about uh, Israel again. Paul starts by saying, brothers and sisters, my heart, heart's desire and prayer to God concerning them is for their salvation. It's interesting to me that Paul, who is a Jew, talks about them as though we're now talking about somebody, uh, in a sense, external to Paul's own experience, even though he is a Jew. And he calls these now Roman Christians, presumably almost entirely Gentiles, not entirely, but close. He calls them brothers and sisters. And he talks about Jews as them. And he again says that the longing of his heart is that they would be saved. And he can testify to the fact that they're really switched on for God. Uh, they are full of zeal, but it's not mixed with a proper understanding of these things. They lack knowledge at a fundamental and important level. And because they're ignorant of the righteousness of God, well, the result is that they've sought to establish their own. That is to say, they're pursuing it. They are trying to capture something rather than receive it from God. So there are two verbs at play, establish your righteousness or submit to God's righteousness. Those are really the two options. And those who are on the outs are those who try to establish their own because your own righteousness cannot be established. That's what the first three chapters were about. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Um, God's standard isn't, she'll be right, God's standard is holiness, and none of us can attain to that. And those who sought to be right with God in that way never got there and never will, but those who submit to God's righteousness can be on the inside with him uh, uh, in a relationship with God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. And the word end is interesting here. Uh, what, you know, we can talk about the end of a queue. Uh, we can talk about the end of a story, the end of a movie, and that means one thing. But if I say uh, the chief end of man is to enjoy, is to love God and enjoy him forever, to know God and enjoy him forever, that's about purpose. That's not terminus. That's about purpose. And so we can look at this and say, Christ is the purpose, the goal, the intent of the law. All that was written by Moses in the law was looking toward the Messiah who will deliver his people. He's the goal of the law for righteousness, not to those who establish their own righteousness, but to everyone who believes. Since Moses wrote, writes about the righteousness that is from the law, the one who does these things will live by them. It's hard to know what to stress. Maybe it's the one who does these things. Because Paul's point is that doing is problematic. If that's the way you're going to get there, you're never going to get there. But the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart who will go up to heaven. I think it's worth observing in passing that the one is Moses talking and the other is the righteousness talking. In righteousness... The righteousness from faith says, do not say in your heart who will go up to heaven, which of course is impossible for me to do. To bring Christ down. Or who will go down into the abyss, which is a place of the dead, and that too is impossible for me to do. Right? So there is already told us by Moses that there are these impossible things to do but you don't have to do them. Don't say who will go up into heaven, who will go down into the abyss. And Paul adds, go up into heaven. Why would you do that? To bring Christ down? To go down into the place of the dead? To bring Christ up from the dead? What's his point? God's already done that for you. So the righteousness that you need depends on the death and resurrection of Christ, and God has already done that for you. You don't need to do this impossible journey. It's already been done because it's about faith. You participate in these things, not by doing the impossible, but by believing. So in one sense, what Moses is saying is, you know what, this is all pretty easy. And he's talking about the law. And I'm thinking it's impossible. But he says, no, it's not really about what you do. 
And Paul is trying to amplify that and emphasize that by talking about what God has done in Christ, the death and resurrection, the, the, the incarnation, I should say, and the resurrection of the Son of the Christ. On the contrary, verse 8, what does it say? The message is near you in your mouth and in your heart. In other words, it's not out there. It's not something hard that you have to go and discover. It's already with you. It's present with you. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. Okay? God's done the work by ascending his son and by raising him from the dead. God's done the impossible, so you don't have to. And if you therefore, verse 9, confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and that's something we can do, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. So he's now bringing us into this discussion, and, and you already know this, I'm aware of that, that it's about faith, it's about believing. One of the questions that I keep coming up against, uh, especially when I was younger, I'd ask, well, what do I need to believe? The Bible's a big book full of all sorts of things. What do I need to believe? And Paul is trying to answer that question. If you believe that Jesus is Lord, and that God raised him from the dead. So there's something you need to believe about Jesus, and there's something you need to believe about God's interaction with Jesus. But if I say that God raised him from the dead, then I have to believe that he was crucified. And then I ask, why was he crucified? Because of that sin question. So the death and resurrection of Jesus are part of that, let's say, content that we need to believe. And he's been elevated, he's been lifted by God from the dead, as our Lord. And what does it mean to say Jesus is Lord? I had a friend who had a jean jacket that dates things. Uh, this was in the 70s. And, and in big, bold letters, it said Jesus is Lord. So everywhere he was going to go, people would see this proclamation that Jesus is Lord. And one of the things that would have done, I think, is in a sense embarrass him just a little bit so that he would have felt like, well, I therefore, if I'm going to proclaim this in this way so everybody sees it, I need to live accordingly. That means there are certain places I'm not going to go wearing this statement that Jesus is Lord. There are certain things I'm not going to do. I'm not going to say if I'm declaring with my jacket that Jesus is Lord. In other words, your life is meant to conform to your confession. And so when you say Jesus is Lord, that's not just three words on the page. That's a life lived in submission to this one who is our God, creator, sustainer, and Lord. So that's the gospel, isn't it? I believe and confess that Jesus is Lord, and I believe right down into my being that God has lifted him from the grave, and that will lead to salvation. That is the vehicle, the, the means, the manner of salvation. Verse 10, one believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness. One confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. So it's not that righteousness and salvation are two different things. It's that there, there's complementary activity going on. Belief that takes place within the person, and confession. In other words, taking what you believe and letting that flow out of you with, I believe, words and actions. And then you'll be saved. So what he's trying to explain to us is why Jews have not been saved in the way you might expect them to. And it's to do with faith. Verse 11. Now the scripture says, everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. Do you see what Paul did there? He, he changed something from about an hour ago. Can you find it? Exactly. Everybody hear that? Verse 33 says, The one who believes in him will not be put to shame. Now, sorry, that was chapter 9, verse 33. This chapter says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame. What's Paul doing? So back in chapter 9, he was talking about Israel in particular, and now he's talking about Jews and Gentiles and saying, everyone, Paul, what right do you have to make such a statement? Have you just changed the scripture? Verse 12 gives some explanation. There is no distinction between Jew and Greek since the same Lord of all is rich to all who call on him. So the divide between Jew and Gentile is done away with. And so for Paul, the word everyone captures that. 
Paul, how can you say, when the scriptures say everyone who believes, sorry, the one who believes will not be put to shame, that it now includes Jews and Greeks? Do you think Isaiah 28, 16 was talking about Jews and Greeks? I don't think so. But then you get the next verse where Paul says, verse 13, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's from Joel 2, verse 32. You probably know that from Acts chapter 2. When the Spirit is poured out, Paul quote, uh, Peter quotes that verse. So there you have the word everyone pushed forward. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So with that everyone in mind, Paul grabs hold of that Isaiah 28 promise or statement and says, everyone who believes in him. So now he's got everyone and belief working together, hand in hand. Yes, even people like us, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. But this raises questions, because how can they call? Who's going to call on the the name of the Lord? People, once you get outside Israel, have never even heard the name of the Lord in the first century, apart from, you know, okay, Paul spent three years in Ephesus telling them about the Lord. But who's going to call on the Lord? And so Paul's been talking about the reality of righteousness by faith. And the only way for salvation is faith. And to some degree, at least, Israel got it wrong because they were looking for the wrong way to get to this righteousness, which is salvation. And that's where he goes in the next paragraph then. It's by faith, but let's talk now in 14 and following about Israel's response to the message. How can they call on him they have not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing? So this is preached probably at more missionary conferences than any other passage of Scripture. It's almost the, the generic, the stereotypical statement about missions. And it's true, but that's not exactly what Paul is getting at here. He says, okay, you can't call unless you believe. Maybe I could say, you wouldn't call. Why would you call? on God if you don't believe in him. So calling depends on believing, and believing depends on hearing. And hearing depends on, well, somebody preaching. And how can they preach unless they're sent? And I would take a step back and say, now hang on a second, maybe not everybody in this room is a a preacher, but we all fit into these verses in that we're all called to present Jesus, to share Jesus, to make the Lord known. Um, So In that sense, we all are preachers. And how can they preach? How can they proclaim Christ? How can they share Christ unless they are sent? And he says, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who announce the gospel of good things. Again, quoting from Isaiah. This is chapter 52. How beautiful are the feet of those who announce the gospel of good things. And I'm sure you're aware of this. He's not overly concerned about feet but it's an expression of the person who will go and share and uh, follow that path, walk that path. But all didn't obey the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? It's almost the next verse. How great it is to announce the gospel, but not everybody believes the gospel. So faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes through the message about Christ. Let's just pause there for a moment. So there is this necessary agenda, we might say. It's what missionaries do. They are sent so that they can proclaim, so that people can hear, so that they can respond in faith. And presumably it's what we have done as we've heard that message and been brought to faith. And it's appropriate to handle it that way, but Paul's point is really what comes up in this next little paragraph. Uh, let me let me uh, back up to verse 17. So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the message about Christ. But I ask, did they not hear? So he's established the means by which you can come to faith. And it depends on hearing. And the first thing is, well, haven't they heard? And his answer is, yes, they've heard. And he quotes from Psalm 19, their voice has gone out into the, all, all the world and their words to the ends of the inhabited world. So I didn't read that correctly, did I? Their voice has gone out to all the earth and their words to the ends of the inhabited world. This actually in Psalm 19 is talking about the stars and how they declare the glories of God. 
And if that's true, how much more than God's chosen people who have gone, who have been scattered abroad to declare the truths of God? In other words, Paul is saying, hearing, of course they've heard. Of course they have. Yes. The scriptures say that they have, have heard and they've been sent. But didn't they understand? Well, okay, maybe they heard. Maybe they even proclaimed, but they don't understand. So at this point, Paul says, well, he asked exactly that. Did not Israel understand? First, Moses said, I'll make you jealous of those who are not a nation. Who's not a nation? Well, the Gentiles. I'll make you angry by a nation that lacks understanding. Now, we're not allowed to use this word in my house, at least when we were raising the kids, but to lack understanding is virtually synonymous with being stupid. The nations with respect to God are stupid, ignorant, whatever term you want to use. And I will make you angry by a nation that is ignorant, that knows nothing. The point, it's not about understanding. It's not about that. I'll take the nobodies and they'll make you jealous. And it's not about understanding. So they need to hear. Have they heard? Well, yeah. Do they understand? Not the issue. So what is the issue? We're almost there. First, we get another statement from Isaiah. I was found by those who are not looking for me. I revealed myself to those who are not asking for me. I'm not sure it always works out this way. Um, uh, uh, The father of a friend of mine was a missionary in Chad. One day he was walking along and he came upon a tribal chief who had climbed up a tree and was shouting out to God because he'd gone through this unfolding process where he realized there must be a God. Somebody must have made this. And I can't find him by my own understanding. The only way I'll ever know him is if he reveals himself to me. And so he climbed up a tree, and he was shouting out, basically, God, reveal yourself to me, just as this father of my friend came walking along and heard this and said, hey, come down and I'll tell you about God. So sometimes there are people who are looking and asking. But I think that's not such a common experience. One day a man named Henry Peterson got into his car and drove from Chicago north to Milwaukee. He would go up and stand on the street corner and preach Jesus. One day my grandfather came walking by. He didn't know anything about God or Jesus. He wasn't asking any questions. He wasn't looking. But he heard Henry Peterson. He heard the gospel and he was converted. Because this man, was he sent? I don't know. I think he just thought it was a good idea to get in his car and drive up to Milwaukee every now and then. He proclaimed Christ. And so my grandfather, who was not looking and not asking, found Jesus. God works very generously that way. It's not about the fact that Israel didn't hear, because of course they did. And it's not that they didn't understand, because that's really not the issue. But God has revealed himself graciously and lovingly to those who aren't looking and are not asking. So where does this leave Israel in all this? Verse 21. To Israel, he says, all day long I have spread out my hands to a disobedient and defiant people. God is patient. God deals generously and lovingly. But Israel here is described as disobedient and defiant. And that too is from the book of Isaiah. That's getting to the end of the book of Isaiah. I have generously and patiently waiting for them to respond in faith, but they're disobedient and they willfully reject. Now we might tend to think that, you know, all Jews need to do is go and offer sacrifice. That's how they take care of their sins. They just chuck a lamb on the fancy barbecue in the temple, and they'll be okay. But you know, when you read Moses, and when you read the book of Hebrews, it becomes really clear that the sacrifices were largely done for sins committed in ignorance. 
it's not as though they have this get out of jail free card when they willfully disobey God, when they turn their back on him. In fact, at that point, God keeps warning them of the danger of willful sin. And the book of Hebrews warns us of the danger of willful sin. We see God's grace set alongside rejection by disobedient and defiant people. Chapter 9 was all about God's sovereignty in bringing people to salvation. And the challenges that that presents are real. This chapter is about human responsibility in response to God's grace and goodness and kindness. The Bible always presents them side by side. It doesn't provide, let's say, a philosophical resolution of these things because both of them are true. God is sovereign. God does choose people. And we are called to be faithful, obedient, responsible people who respond rightly to grace. And I find this verse pretty sobering. What if I'm a disobedient person? What if I'm a defiant person? Are there... Moments in life are there uh, days when I am disobedient and defiant. I'm tempted to say, of course there are. Are there times when I engage in willful sin? And again, I have to say, well, yeah. Sometimes I'm, I'm caught off guard and I do something I shouldn't. Sometimes there's a bit of a buildup, a lead up to it, and I'm doing something I shouldn't. That's, I think, the nature of our lives, at least to some degree. And so this becomes a really sobering word for me. Romans, as earlier said, the wage of the sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I want to appeal to you, I want to urge you to cling to Christ. Uh, we had the question about assurance, and that's a really hard question to deal with because You know, as we deal with different people, we have different issues and different concerns to do with assurance. I don't want to give a person false assurance. How destructive would that be? But then there's a person with a tender conscience who's worrying and wondering. And I want to say to that person, do you trust in Christ? Have you looked to the Lord? Because this chapter is saying that there is a faith that saves. I should have said there's a God who saves people of faith. And that's a wonderful truth. So let's examine ourselves, but not too much. Let's take a look at the way we live, but not too much. If we're going to fixate on something, let it be the cross work of Christ and the person who is our Lord. Do you live with your life and confess that Jesus is Lord? Do you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead? There are great promises for people who Embrace that reality. But Israel, oh, Israel, Paul doesn't say this lightly. Paul is one of them. So he knows what this means and the pain that's involved here. All day long I've thrown out my hands to to a disobedient and defiant people. God's patience, willful rejection, frightening truth. Well, let's stop there. Um, Paul's trying to draw us into an understanding of grace, what it is to trust in Jesus in a way that brings salvation. It's by faith. May we be people of faith. Thank you, Philip. I'm uh, very much itching to hear the first one now. <laughs> um, before we have some question time, uh, I'll give you a minute to spend some time just reflecting. Uh, there's a few prompt questions at the bottom of your page. Well, I'm sure there'll be more time this afternoon in between lunch and the bush dance. Uh, to keep thinking about it and reflecting on it. Uh, but for now, we'll uh, have a few questions. Or if anyone's got any questions, Philip? I do have a question. Okay, first and second. Okay. Oh, um, you're going to repeat the question. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, you know, 
So uh, verses four to five and six. Um, so don't uh, is Paul saying don't? Uh, Christ isn't saying. What was the question? Sorry, I'm trying to rephrase it for uh, the. That's okay. Um, yep. Is Paul saying there? Could you can you read that in the light of Paul is saying to them, don't go picking and choosing who you can preach this gospel to. Rather than God has done the impossible for you, don't be concerned that you're saved. Like, does that make sense? Yeah. I think that should come through. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, thanks for the question. That's an interesting way of looking at it. Um, I'm, I'm going to go with the more spatial, the up and down thing. Uh, so we have this expression of bringing something down. Uh, that's not so much... Um, a, a phrase that Paul would use in that way. So the scripture that he's talking about is about going up into heaven or going down. So it's very much a spatial movement. And he's saying you don't need to um, go up to heaven. You don't need to. First of all, you can't. But why would you even contemplate that? Well, to, to get the Messiah here. You, you can't go to heaven and you don't need to bring the Messiah here because God's done it already for you. And I think that's what Moses wants to communicate. So Paul is, um, in a sense, putting the Messiah into what Moses has written because Moses is forward-looking, but Paul is after the fact in terms of the incarnation and the resurrection. Uh, so uh, the question is a really interesting one, but I think it assumes a, um, an expression that we would use in English that isn't part of Paul's uh, language. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for the question. You had a question? I have been, I work with children of all ages who have um, vertical regulation issues and they've often had a really staggering background in that space. Um, and I teach them about and to regulate their emotions, but I just know that what they really need is hope and mm. hope that I have. And so what I'm trying to find is something in the seat that I can hop into my talk to say, um, when they know that that's how they can see they've been in trouble over and over again. Um, I need something that teaches them the hope. I, want, I really want to give them the hope that I have. But I need to be short, succinct, and that's one thing I'm not being kind of it at. I'm wondering, um, can you have a feel for what's going on here and say that something? What can we say to people who need help? and even know that they need hope. I'm not convinced there is a short, succinct statement that's going to work in, in a broad way. Um, and the beauty of the scriptures, in part at least, is that it, it sort of speaks into our lives and we all have a different life, and yet there's content here that relates to uh, each one of us. So I guess the short answer is the, the rescue you need from yourself is available in what Jesus has done for us. That's a short statement, but boy, you need to unpack that in a whole lot of different directions, don't you, for that to really grab hold in people's lives. Yep. So, so your life and Jesus' life and, and these things become the embodied message of Christ. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. And I have the 
Jesus Christ in the other day. Does God still have a soft spot for Jews in Israel? Uh, chapter 11, um, I think chapter 11 proves that the answer is yes. But to get to that, we have to define what it is to be Israel. And so there's work done along the way. Now, um, we'll look at that in a fairly comprehensive way, hopefully, uh, tomorrow. But if, in a word, I would say the answer is yes.